Good day to everyone. I hope that you enjoyed the nice pictures of the River Kwai. My name is Werner Schweppes, and I formerly served as the Tasco Mansman Joint Venture Project Director. I would like to share my experience during that time, specifically, the events related to building the two River Kwai crossings of the Jardana Gas Pipeline. This pipeline spans 239.7 kilometers from Ban Itong to Ratchaburi Power Station. I led a team of 1900 people during my time as manager, and the video serves as a reminder of the incredible challenges we faced while working on the two River Kwai pipeline crossings in Kanchanaburi, near the Sayak waterfall in the city of Namtok, 25 years ago. I have created this video presenting great pictures and technical explanations that provide a clear understanding of what happened. Rest assured, the video accurately depicts the truth of my involvement. Normally the river is called Kwai Noi River, but I use here River Kwai. The title of this video is when a 42-inch pipeline met the River Kwai in Kanchanaburi, and this means our Jordana gas pipeline works on the two unique River Kwai crossings at pipeline kilometer 68 and at pipeline kilometer 100. Why are our River Kwai crossings unique? Because nobody else has crossed the River Kwai with a 42-inch pipeline. The main attraction appears to be the Sayak waterfall, which flows into the River Kwai close to our pipeline river crossing, at pipeline kilometer 68. The River Kwai also runs through the Sayak National Park. Its landscape and scenery are perhaps the most beautiful places in Thailand. Inside there is the historically famous Hellfire Pass mountain cutting is located. There is an excellent museum now that tells you the sad history of the Hellfire Pass. It would be an omission here not to mention that the River Kwai in Kanchanaburi is chiefly known from the 1957 famous movie, The Bridge on the River Kwai, in which Colonel Nicholson reluctantly agrees to Camp Commander Sato's suggestion of getting the world's second war prisoners to build a railway bridge. However, the bridge project soon became an obsession for him. As I told you before we had to cross the River Kwai as well, but what I did not tell you was that I had in Kanchanaburi a kind of strong obsession as well, and this was to finish the Jardana gas pipeline project on time, as it was stipulated in the contract with mechanical completion by the 15th June 1998. However, my obsession was cured quite fast, because PTT did not give us all the required land on time. By not getting the land on time you cannot finish on time. It is important to note that there is a 32.2 km long section of the Jardana pipeline, running mostly next to the National Road 323 between the two river crossings. Along this stretch, you will find block valve stations 5 and 6. Prior to block valve 5, significant earthwork was completed by us due to PTT's change order number 16. This required an additional pipe earth cover from 1 to 1.5 meters and the cutting off a big part of the mountain alongside road 323 for approximately 6 kilometers. Based on this change we could not use in this area our automatic welding spread anymore and we lost productivity. If somebody would like to know what disruption is, this it is, and this was only a small part of the entire disruption on the project that we obtained. The earthwork was done based on a highway department requirement to ensure that when the road is widened, the pipeline won't be left hanging in the air. Concrete slabs were also installed as pipeline protection where the pipeline was running parallel to roads. This protection was ordered by PTT, with change order number 1, after the highway department insisted on it as a mandatory requirement. One may wonder when such measurements are necessary and why Nova Gas did not specify them accordingly in the contract drawings from the beginning. It can only be assumed that Nova Gas had no contact with the road authorities and was not aware of all requirements due to missing site reconnaissance surveys. 62 kilometers of concrete slabs and cutting 6 kilometers of mountains including half a meter additional pipeline cover are not insignificant. There were major design errors that we suffered from, but those were only two of many other design errors to follow. Please wait until you see the river crossings. Within this pipeline stretch of 32.2 kilometers is the area of the historical Thai Burma Railway located as well. For your information, we have buried the Jordana pipeline six times below this old historical railway, and this even without recognizing it with one exception. One time in the area between those two river crossings, we had a problem at pipeline kilometer 94.2, where our pipeline work was blocked by a railway fanatic. Here the pipeline crosses the old historical Thai Burma railway track, which was not shown on their drawings. Again, it looked like Nova Gas had issued the project drawings without doing any site reconnaissance surveys before. 
this railway fanatic got the ridiculous idea that we should drill underneath this old railway track, and Nova Gas supported this and stopped our work with instruction number 24, issued on 31st May 1997. I categorically refused to do such a thrust boring work on a steep hill because it was completely impractical to do and we would have to cut off one quarter of the hill. But this showed the attitude of Nova Gas and PTT again they disrupted us wherever it was possible. So, in reality, this stop was for nothing and absolute nonsense, because months later, we carried out our work as we intended it to do the first time that means we installed the pipeline in our normal construction method, we refurbished the old track with its tones, and this was the end of this story that had cost only money and some disruption. I have to say that I know the area, and this is a place where hardly anybody can walk due to the steep hill and the wild vegetation that is growing there. This is not something like the Hellfire Pass where you can go with your family to see the sad railway history. It is deep remoteness and only for people looking for an adventure and in reality, you will see hardly anything. During our pipeline work, we excavated quite some big holes in the 32.2 km long pipeline stretch in close vicinity of the historical railway. I do not know what kind of relics our pipeline crews found in this area, but as far as I know, we did not find any of the Japanese gold that some Japanese soldiers allegedly buried somewhere around the old railway track, or they have hidden it in caves. This means that the hope still exists that one day somebody will find the Second World War Japanese gold here in Thailand. Here is an overview of the Tasco Mansman Joint Venture Organization chart from March 1998, showing the structure and responsibilities of the joint venture. Now you know what our organization looked like. It was a big organization and needed strict control. Let us now return to our pipeline river crossing story, and as I mentioned before, at two points along the Giordana pipeline route the pipeline crosses the River Kwai, and I have to go back to April of 1997. At this time, we always had Monday meetings at PTT's office in Bangkok. In those meetings, I raised my doubts with PTT and Nova Gas Project Management about the feasibility of executing the two River Kwai crossings using horizontal directional drilling. In my view, the subsurface conditions at both crossings did not allow the drilling of a hole in which a 42-inch pipeline could have been pulled in. Dr. Pongsak was most of the time with me in those Monday meetings, and he fully supported my opinion as well. However, our opinion was rejected by the consultant Nova Gas, who instructed us to go ahead and execute the crossings by horizontal directional drilling. It was like talking to a wall. We had follow-up meetings, but I have to say that those meetings were in general useless and only time-wasting. At least sometimes we had some loud fights mostly with Nova Gas which made us feel good. Those fights were in respect to the design not being finished, engineering errors, such as concrete slabs and road embankments, the creek crossing lumpachi, land problems, payments, and more. Nova Gas talked around it and came back with some irrelevant nonconformance reports that they have issued and safety items. In general, they always told us how bad the Tasco Mansman joint venture was in the job performance. I replied to them that we were doing a good job and that they could be happy to have such a good contractor and that we helped PTT as well. After those fights went on for a while, they always ended in a way that Sampong PTT's project director started to talk in the Thai language. All foreigners that participated in the meeting could not understand anything anymore. I did not care too much because Dr. Ponsak was present who of course as a Thai national understood every word. I was only sitting there and writing down things in my blue book which I had to do. Later Dr. Pongsak told me what was said. But Nova Gas had no tie in their group, so the Nova Gas project manager Gallagher complained and wanted to talk in English, but he was just ignored by Sampong. What Sampong was saying can be summarized as simple nonsense, do not write too many letters and be a good contractor. I was for more than 20 years in the international construction business and such crap nobody had to tell me. Yes, of course, PTT does not like it when somebody is telling them that the pipeline design provided in the contract has engineering errors and that PTT does not give us the required land for construction on time. I did not come from the pipeline kindergarten, I came from the pipeline big boy school where I worked as mansman with Bechtel, Floor, and other engineering construction organizations, big clients like Saudi Aramco on large difficult projects, and was not an idiot. Those people from PTT and Nova Gas would not change my managing style and how I would conduct my work as a project director. I knew those people from my Giordana contract negotiations in November-December 1996 already and was well aware that they did not like us as contractor and me as well. 
I did not want to have the job as Jordana project director, but by the middle of December 1996, Dr. Fritz Bruhl insisted that I had to do it. The work that I did not want because I was before already the area manager for Arabia and North Africa. I had enough and my nose full from construction projects and being stationed on construction sites, but I had to do it. Anyhow that was a bit different story, but now I have to tell you that about the contract. The contract included all project drawings that were prepared by PTT's consultant Nova Gas, and those drawings showing all the detailed design of the Jordana gas pipeline, including three major river crossings. These three major river crossings were two on the River Kwai and one at the Meiklong River at pipeline kilometer 228 in the Ratchaburi province. The design and the method of constructing these three major river crossings was specified on the approved for construction drawings and was horizontal directional drilling. This design is supposedly based on geological investigations and approval of regulatory and other authorities of Thailand. On the river Meiklong, we conducted the horizontal directional drilling crossing. This drilling operation was performed by our subcontractor Bilfinger and Berger, who declared themselves as horizontal directional drilling expert. The drilling operation started in early June 1997. A problem occurred during the pulling in of the 600-meter long pipe string. The 42-inch pipe string got stacked inside the drill hole after around 450 meters of pulling. It needed to be pulled out by us using two of our CAT 594 heavy side booms and CAT D8 dozers. What was happened? The back reamer barrel was connected to a drill pipe sting. This drill pipe string due to too high torque forces broke off and the pulling in of our 42-inch pipe string got stacked. We were very lucky that we got it out. With this, we got our terrifying experience with the horizontal directional drilling already and I was thinking on the river Kwai crossing that it will never work. Subsequently during the second attempt the pipe string was pulled in without any problem and was finished by the end of July 1997. A stone fell from my heart and my very nervous mood calmed down. The earth cover on top of this river crossing was between 6 and 20 meters, and this is very deep. It was of course known to us that the local conditions of the subsoil and the topography between the Meiklong River crossing area and the River Kwai region were not the same. Why we knew this is easy to answer, because of our pipeline trenching work. With this work, we experienced the subsurface conditions in all of these areas. On the river locations in Kanchanaburi we were a couple of hundred meters far away, we found what we considered a non-drillable ground condition. Since we have found this in our trenching area and the river area itself could not have been much different. Just when you went to the river you could see the rock earth formation clearly. Not enough we took long tail boats and did our visual inspection on both crossings from the water as well. The result of what we saw was clear bedrock which was uneven, and there was evidence of karsticity, which describes an irregular limestone region, with sinks, underground streams, and caverns. This we could see due to the water level changes in the River Kwai that were controlled by the Kaul Arm Dam and Tong Pa Pum. On 27 June of 1997, we requested in an official and letter the permission to execute the crossings utilizing open cut. PTT and their consultants stated that any alternative method would have to be approved by the regulatory authorities and denied open cuts. This statement was something like a bad joke as well, because PTT was responsible for obtaining all the regulatory approvals from the Thai authorities. It is important to know that the horizontal directional drilling subcontractor Bilfinger and Berger stated in June 1997 in their lump sum offer to us that they could drill through any type of material that may be encountered. Such confirmation was also given by Bilfinger and Berger to PTT and their consultant Nova Gas, behind our back as well. This was just irresponsible and unbelievable from the subcontractor. I got quite annoyed about this situation and I told our people. Okay, when they think they can do it let them drill until the cows come home. In addition, I stated that after the failure of this drill, we would backcharge Bilfinger and Berger for failure to do their work which they said they could do. Furthermore, we would make a design error claim to PTT by specifying the wrong river crossing method in the contract. Our strong requests to PTT and Nova Gas to change the crossing method from horizontal directional drilling to open cuts continued until the end of March 1998. We considered this drilling method as an impossible task. However, each time that we requested permission for an open cut this was rejected by Nova Gas. Just unbelievable and almost ridiculous. PTT Nova Gas insisted on HDD, despite their own horizontal directional drilling specification, that says that the contractor shall verify the ground condition as stated in paragraph 7. And yes, I repeat myself, we told them early on that the ground is not drillable. 
you have to know when drilling a 542 meter long horizontal directional drilling hole in an area where the substructure consists of rock and sand, you will encounter a problem with your drilling slurry. We are not even talking here about widening the pilot hole to a 42 inch hole with a back reamer, because you will not come to this point. But let's assume you will come to this point, then you have to pull in a 42 inch pipe string to which an HDPE twin conduit is attached. There for sure will be soil interaction during the pullback operation during the pipe string pulling in work, which means that the HDPE twin conduit and the fusion bonded epoxy coating of the pipe string will come into contact with the hard and fissured rock. For sure those two would obtain damages in such a pulling activity. Maybe even the steel pipe would have some severe scratches. Here we not even looking to the stiffness of the pipe string. Would PTT as a prudent operator of the Giordana pipeline system risk any potential of a coating or even pipe damage where the Giordana pipeline has a minimum lifetime design of 40 years? The answer should be clearly no. It has to be stated here as well that a good functioning cathodic protection system should not be a substitute for any coating damage, and 40 years is a long time. If PTT management had opened their own eyes to this situation, they would have known that there were only two possibilities to overcome the river Kwai crossing problems. The first method is the use of the open cut and installation of concrete coated pipe siphons into the river. The second method is to build pipeline bridges over the river Kwai to install the pipeline to cross above ground. For environmental and safety reasons the Tasco Mansman joint venture recommended the open cut method. However, PTT and the engineer Nova Gas OGP insisted that the crossings should be executed by horizontal directional drilling, supported by the opinion of the subcontracted so-called drilling expert that conducted the failed drilling work later. In relation to this matter, I would like to mention Wayne Coswell, the chief inspector at Nova Gas. This Moran was the major advocate for horizontal directional drilling, and his unprofessional behavior went unpunished. Perhaps PTT liked him even more due to the significant difficulties he caused us with the river crossings. Bilfinger and Berger took advantage of our situation as we had no other option but to use horizontal directional drilling for the two river Kwai crossings, knowing the position of PTT and their consultant Nova Gas. On 21 January 1998, they abruptly increased their drilling price by 338% per meter. They shortened the drilling on each crossing by an average of 90 meters to 542 meters. This price increase caused great distress in our TMJV office and raised our blood pressure. For us, Bilfinger and Berger was not a credible work partner anymore. On 2 February 1998, Bilfinger and Berger's work began on the horizontal directional drilling river crossing project at pipeline kilometer 68. They drilled from the east to the west side of the River Kwai, where on 560-meter-long 42-inch pipe was assembled to be later pulled into the drilling hole. They tried quite hard to finish the pilot hole. However, it was soon discovered this time by Bilfinger and Berger that the area had inconsistencies in the rock layers, with the presence of hard and fissured rock, as well as cavities within the rock. What a surprise. This made it impossible to complete the drilling, as the necessary drilling fluids could not be maintained. These fluids consist of refined bentonite mixed with freshwater to create a mud that is crucial for the drilling process. To put it simply, if there are no drilling fluids in the hole, horizontal directional drilling cannot proceed. Despite this setback, Bilfinger and Berger had to push on with the drilling, as they had already made commitments to PTT and us that they could do it. As it was stated in our monthly progress report of February 1998, they had three drilling failures. On 25 March 1998, Bilfinger and Berger abandoned the horizontal directional drilling project at the River Kwai crossing at KP-68 after four unsuccessful attempts to drill the pilot hole without our permission. As a result, I informed our procurement manager, Rolf Walter, and our commercial management team, Mrs. Sumali and Oscar Biavd, to halt all payments to Bilfinger and Berger. Our contract manager, Mike McGowan, also became involved. At a meeting held on 7 April 1998 at our Kanchanaburi office, Bilfinger and Berger informed us that they believed it was not feasible to finish the project using horizontal directional drilling. We inquired if there were any changes in the site subsurface conditions, but they replied negatively. I expressed my deep frustration and disappointment, stating that they had utilized our project as a test run for their horizontal directional drilling experiment, which was unacceptable. The meeting with Bilfinger and Berger was very unpleasant, and they declined our offer for a settlement. 
On the 16th of April 1998, we requested Bilfinger and Berger's assistance with open cut work by providing equipment such as pontoons, drilling rigs, and long arm excavators, but unfortunately, they declined our request. In order to avoid having to go back later in this video to this story, I will continue with Bilfinger and Berger. It won't take too long. In March of 1999, I visited the Bilfinger and Berger office in Bangkok to finalize the subcontract and settle outstanding payments owed to us. During my meeting with their managing director, we were unable to come to an agreement. I informed him that the Tasco Mansman joint venture would be forced to pull their performance bond issued by Deutsche Bank. He threatened to sue us in response. I replied to him, okay then we will each other see in court. In April 1999, we requested the payment for the Bilfinger and Berger performance bond that we had in our hands from Deutsche Bank. They asked for time to speak with Bilfinger and Berger, and we agreed. It seems that Deutsche Bank did speak to them because Bilfinger and Berger suddenly agreed to a compromise, and the issue was resolved. It's important to note that Bilfinger and Berger stopped their horizontal directional drilling business after our failed crossing project on the River Kwai, where they used us as a hostage in their attempt to become the champion of horizontal directional drilling in a not drillable subsurface structure. In February 1998, we received written approval from the harbor authorities to execute the crossings using open cut, which was a crucial matter. We took the initiative to obtain this authorization and did not receive any assistance from PTT. If we had not independently sought permission from the harbor board to open cut the crossing, there would have been a major delay in completing the works. This behavior by PTT indicates that they did not support us and seemed to have the intention of causing harm to the Tasco Mansman joint venture and later taking the contractual penalty from us, which was a significant amount of money. Now it was nearing the end of March 1998 and there was much debate surrounding the topic of the two River Kwai crossings. Looking back on it 25 years later, I still cannot understand why PTT behaved the way they did. They needed the pipeline to transport gas from Myanmar, and their gas purchasing contract included a penalty clause as well. I don't believe this behavior was reflective of the Thai mentality having lived in Thailand since September 1996, I can attest the Thais typically avoid self-harm. Rather, it seems to me that this was simply a case of mismanagement on the part of PTT, likely fueled by their disdain for the Tasco Mansman joint venture. Eventually one year too late, PTT agreed on 31 March 31, 1998, to follow our previous recommendation of using the open-cut method for those particular crossings. Their consultant instructed us that the contractor, meaning ourselves, could choose whichever method of river crossing was deemed most appropriate. We encountered a straightforward lying situation with Nova Gas, and this was simply unbelievable. They claimed that the Tasco Mansman joint venture had complete control over the pipeline construction method at river crossings. However, when we requested the drawings for these crossings at KP-68 and KP-100, they did not reply. Silence was their answer. Of course, we were fully aware that such contract drawings did not exist. They were telling big lies, but at least everyone knew the truth even PTT. I have to say here that during the bid negotiations on 4 December 1996, Nova Gas asked us to include the cost of horizontal directional drilling in our bid, which we accepted. However, the contract included a viability clause on which we imprudently relied on. Now during our work in the KP100 crossing area, we encountered two major problems with landowners between KP99.7 on the east side and KP100.3 on the west side. The first issue arose at kilometer 99.7 on the east side, where the landowner refused us permission to carry out our work on their property, resulting in work stoppages until the beginning of April 1998. This led to further delays in our progress. The second problem occurred at the same time on the west side of the river at KP 100.3. PTT did not provide us with the land we needed for our work because the landowner required the purchase of their entire 72,000 square meter land. PTT was unable to buy the land, so we had to purchase it through our joint venture partner, TIPCO. Our Dr. Pongsak did the negotiations. Although we were able to resolve this land issue, Nova Gas and PTT continued to hinder our work with nastiness and threatened to impose penalties if we did not complete the project by achieving mechanical completion by 15 June 1998. We encountered issues not only at crossing KP100, but also at the crossing at KP68 on both sides of the river. Specifically, there was a problem on the east side where a farmer had a pineapple field. 
PTT forced us again to resolve these landowner issues, which took us until the 19th of April 1998 to complete. Following this, we began our right-of-way work of cutting the river embankments on the 20th of April 1998. I would like to emphasize that a successful open-cut pipeline river crossing project necessitates meticulous planning and detailed front-end design. Unfortunately, due to unforeseen circumstances, we were forced to complete these tasks in a very condensed time frame with overlapping schedules. In January 1998, well in advance of the failed horizontal directional drill, I instructed our procurement team to send 280 meters of line pipes, with a 20.53 mm wall thickness, and some hot bends to a Ratchaburi shop for concrete coating. On 2 April 1998, we issued a work schedule for two crossings. However, due to issues with landowners, as I explained already, we were unable to begin our right-of-way work as planned. Additionally, we did not have the required pontoons for offshore trenching work. It's important to note that we had 20 construction sites running simultaneously together with these two river crossings. On 2 April 1998, we submitted change order request number 49 to PTT to compensate us for the additional work we had to do. Although PTT did not issue a change order to us, issuing this request was necessary to document the crossing's sad story from a contractual perspective. I instructed our procurement manager and commercial manager to gather the cost documents for the two now open cut river crossings and provide them to Mike McGowan, our contract manager. As a large organization with 1,900 employees and a total number of 740 pieces of construction equipment including trucks and cars, it was crucial to ensure that each department received clear instructions from me to fulfill their work obligations in order to achieve success. And for sure we needed success. We were forced by PTT and their consultant Nova Gas to carry out detailed engineering for two open-cut river crossings, despite it not being included in our original work scope. This was achieved through their silence they failed to provide us with the necessary drawings required for the job. Without the drawings, we were unable to proceed with the River Kwai Open Cut River Crossings work. To resolve this problem, we subcontracted to Lamotte River Crossing Engineering, an engineering group in Germany with expertise in pipeline open cut river crossings. They performed all necessary calculations and created detailed crossing drawings, showing that a 10.5 cm thick continuous concrete coating on the line pipes and a minimum of 10 cm of cover at the river bottom fulfilled the buoyancy requirement. Our pipes were concrete coated in this way and had a minimum of 100 cm of cover at the river bottom. The detailed de Lamotte engineering began in April 1998 after we provided them with the required site survey information. De Lamotte Group provided site expertise and did an excellent job. Everything was in order. The two concrete-coated swan neck siphons had the following dimensions. First at pipeline kilometer 100 the siphon culvert was 140 meters long, with a weight of 205 tons. Second at pipeline kilometer 68, the siphon culvert was 99 meters long, with a weight of 145 tons. The detailed design calculations and crossing drawings are shown in this video. The drawings from our engineering subcontractor, De Lamotte, still require approval from the engineers at Nova Gas. However, I didn't wait for any approval. Instead, I directed our team to commence work on the activities we could do immediately. Fortunately, the concrete coating of the line pipes had already been completed, which was a stroke of good luck. This was the exact reason why the people at PTT and Nova Gas were so angry with me. I didn't care about their approval beforehand because we were responsible for the construction outcome, whether they approved or not. It wasn't necessary for me to ask for permission to concrete coat the line pipes because we had custody of them and I did the right thing with those pipes. The fact is that neither PTT nor Nova Gas had contributed anything to those two open cut crossings, no design calculations, no drawings, and no approval from the harbor authorities for the open cuts. My contractual thinking was sometimes very easy, if you don't give us the things required, we will give not you the things you require. This was my old boss and teacher Horst Schreiker school. The contract is not a one-way street. Despite our significant contributions to PTT's project, Nova Gas criticized every move we made. It seemed that they had forgotten that PTT needed a well-built functioning pipeline to be completed as quickly as possible. Many times, I asked and answered Nova Gas at the same time the question. Who was responsible for everything and had accomplished good progress and quality work on the Giordana pipeline? 
who had procured most of the materials for the pipeline project and even helped by purchasing 7.5 kilometers of 42-inch line pipes, who put the pipes into the ground, who guaranteed the pipeline system, and who was getting paid very slowly by PTT. The answer was simple we the Tasco Mansman joint venture. When I reminded Nova Gas of our job responsibilities, they remained silent and gave me a stupid smile, making me feel hated. After the drilling failure of the horizontal directional drilling, we needed floating pontoons, drilling rigs, and long arm excavators to be mobilized to our Kanchanaburi work sites in parallel at the two river crossings. Such equipment was required to do our now offshore work from the water. We encountered a major problem we couldn't find suitable pontoons and equipment necessary for our crossings. It wasn't until almost the end of April 1998 that we finally found Italian Thai, who had the equipment available due to just finishing a job. To acquire the pontoons, Mr. Piakern, Dr. Pongsak and I visited the Italian Thai Construction Company in Bangkok. At that time, they were constructing the Skytrain and had their construction office at the Chattachak Skytrain station, which was still under construction. We met with one of their top managers, and we did ask the manager for the supply of the required pontoons and other equipment that we urgently needed for the two river crossings in Kanchanaburi. Thanks to Mr. Piakern's great relationship with Italian Thai, we were able to negotiate and secure the necessary floating pontoons, drilling, and excavation equipment in a timely manner. It was a relief to come to an agreement with them. Unfortunately, due to the large size of the pontoons, we had to cut them into four pieces for transportation to our construction sites in Kanchanaburi. After the pontoons arrived in late April 1998, we wasted no time in reassembling them and performing the welding work required. It took us around four weeks to get those pontoons ready to go into the water of the River Kwai. The two river crossings were built in accordance with the drawings issued by the German River Crossing Engineering Office de Lamotte. As stated, before PTT did not provide us with the necessary construction drawings for our work. The work steps I am telling you here about applied to both of the river crossings at KP68 and KP100 because they were very similar in the work structure and sequence. I want to emphasize the importance of our work at the two river crossings. For this reason, the river crossing expert chief engineer de Lamotte was later present before the lowering inactivity was performed. Failure for us was not an option. Unfortunately, sometimes river crossings can go wrong, like the accident on the 15th of October 1995 at Special Point 36 in Morocco. At the 48-inch MPL pipeline at KP367 plus 620, something went terribly wrong during the river crossing lowering and work. As you can see in the picture included in this video, some of the side booms carrying the siphon culvert fell with their load into the trench due to an unknown mistake to me. It appears that someone greatly underestimated the force of gravity in this situation when those side booms were carrying the siphon culvert. Again, under all circumstances, we had to avoid such a situation would occur here at the River Kwai. Throughout the open-cut phases of the River Kwai crossings, safety, health, and environmental concerns were our topmost priority for this heavy work. Our spread boss Heinz Orth and the River Crossings advisor from the engineering office de Lamotte were responsible for ensuring that all safety standards were met during the River Crossings installation. During the construction of the River Kwai Open Cut Crossings, we carefully adhered to our safety and environmental plans that were approved by PTT and Nova Gas beforehand. This was to make sure that any negative impact on the river environment was minimized and that our people worked in a safe way. We provided all the required resources to ensure the safety, health, and environmental well-being of our team members. The crossing advisor conducted brief training sessions to ensure that every team member carried out their work duties correctly and with the necessary responsibility. Both construction sites had medical first aid measures readily available. Sanitary facilities were installed by us as well. We used radios to communicate. We only used the necessary construction equipment to go into the water to minimize any contamination of the water. The wet ditch construction was used by us to build the crossings, and the Kaul Arm Dam, located in Tong Papam, regulated the water levels of the River Kwai, which was beneficial for our efforts. The dam did not alter the amount of water flowing through the river, only the timing was adjusted. Our Mr. Piakern was instrumental in coordinating our work, and we highly appreciated his great help. During this period, there were false reports in certain Thai newspapers, claiming that PTT planned to close down the Kaul Arm Dam, resulting in a halt to the water supply into the River Kwai. This was nonsense because it was actually me who requested Mr. Piakern to communicate with the Kaul Arm Dam operator and arrange a specific schedule for the water flow. 
The average water flow velocity of the River Kwai is between 1.5 to 4 meters per second, depending on the dam operation. Just for your information the dam produces electrical power. The river contained a significant volume of rocks, which eliminated the need for a covered dam and helped to minimize the quantity of sediments in the water. But this was the only advantage of the present rock that we had. Before those floating pontoons could go into the water our civil construction team completed the clearing and grading of the area close to the water of the River Kwai crossings. Our earthwork activities started on 20 April 1998. The site preparation was done by removing and storing the topsoil separately for easy replacement during site grading. Trees along the right-of-way were cut down and their stumps were extracted using CAT 320 and CAT 330 excavators. After clearing, grading was immediately carried out. On the west side right-of-way was 40 meters wide, providing ample space for all our equipment and earth and rock material storage. Those excess materials and rocks were trucked away and stockpiled on the land adjacent to the right-of-way. These materials were later used for backfill activities. The right-of-way went through the large sloped embankments, which were higher than 10 meters due to the landscape of the river embankment area, which included sandy soils, hard rock, fissured rock, and cavities within the rock. We had built the right-of-way like a highway, allowing for smooth transportation of heavy load to the river. All the rock was removed through excavation, partially ripping, and mostly blasting. The same approach was taken on the east side of the river. Here the right-of-way width was around 30 meters. But the cutting of those river embankments was the same more than 10 meters high. Throughout the entire installation period, our right-of-way let me say the highway was day by day maintained to ensure smooth driving of our heavy construction equipment when transporting the heavy siphon culvert load to the river. The special platform was built close to the river to provide the 70-ton cranes with a solid stand so that the crane could effectively support the lowering of the culvert. Some steel sheet piling was installed as well to support this platform stand. The marine equipment list that Italian Thai gave to us shows all the different types of pontoons that we got, whereby the drilling and excavation pontoons were the most important ones. Those pontoons were specifically designed for inland canals and rivers and could carry up to a 30-ton excavator and all the different kinds of rock drilling rigs. After those pontoons were reassembled our construction crew would slide the pontoons into the river by pushing and pulling them down on the right-of-way using an excavator. To make sure that those pontoons stayed in place aligned over the pipeline trench centerline while excavating, we secured the floating pontoons with a steel wire spanned across the river and anchored on both sides. The siphon culvert had to be installed with a minimum of one meter of cover from the riverbed to the top of the pipeline, and the trenching of the underwater pipeline ditch was the most time-consuming task of the entire river crossing works. The time that we spend is shown in the two bar charts included in this video. This trenching process included drilling, blasting, rock hammering, excavation, and cleaning. Considering the required depth of 2.5 meters you can say that it was almost nerve-wracking how long it took. But that's how it was with these very hard underwater rock formations. In some areas, the trench had even a depth of around 3 meters due to the removal of large rocks. Emulite, a high-performance emulsion explosive that is designed for hard and extremely hard rock blasting, was used by us for our blasting activities. We had cartridges with a diameter of 30 millimeters that we detonated underwater and, on the land, adjacent to the river where we had large rock formations as well. For the blasting, we used an optimized technique due to our environmental awareness of the blasting impact on the river. This was done by carefully considering the rock structure and determining the blasting pattern. Specified delays were used to allow rock movement prior to causing additional rock material to be displaced. For the blasting drilling preparation, we positioned the pontoon as close to the river bank as possible and onto the center line of the trench, as directed by our surveyors. The drilling equipment consisted of the downhole drilling machine, SR-52, the hydraulic drilling machine, LM-500, and an air compressor that was installed onto the pontoon. For the first hole we used the SR-52 drill connected to the compressor was used to sink a 6 and a quarter inch diameter down the bottom drill bit around 50 centimeters deep into the tough rock. After that, the down the bottom drill bit was taken out, leaving the drilled hole in place. Subsequently, we verified its location and depth by measuring the water level against the staff gauge. As a reference here we used a profile map of the trench bottom. When the hole's location was confirmed, we inserted a 6-inch diameter galvanized casing pipe into the drilled hole. Following this, a 4-inch diameter casing pipe was placed inside the 6-inch casing pipe. 
We used a drilling pattern with three straight lines as shown in the sketch included in this video. Maybe this sounds all a bit too complicated, but allow me to continue because, on this drilling procedure, you will recognize how time-consuming this work activity was. Now we needed to drill a 3-inch hole through the 4-inch casing that was secured by a 6-inch casing pipe to a depth of 1 meter, by using the 3-inch LM500 drill, and with this the hole was ready for charging with explosives. The first line with drilled holes was located at the center of the trench, while the other two drilling lines were offset by 1.2 meters to the left and right. We drilled all three lines simultaneously as the pontoon traveled across the river. Following the completion of each hole, explosive material was promptly inserted. A non-electric detonator was situated in the primer and combined with a magnum column charge before being placed into a plastic tube. The tube was then inserted into the casing of the prep drill hole. For a water depth of 6 meters, approximately 1.25 kilograms of explosive was used per cubic meter of rock. To protect fish life, some pre-blasting was carried out so that the fish swam away. It should not be forgotten to say that we had all the required permits and licenses from the Thai authorities. We installed warning signs and control measures close to the riverside before ant blasting was conducted. We needed to measure the underwater trench dimensions at the river Kwai crossings. To do this, we created a steel frame tool that we called U-Boot. This U-Boot was 1.3 meters wide and built with the guidance and ideas of our spread boss, Heinz Orth, and had a trapezium shape and was used to verify the width and depths of the trench bottom and ensure that the trench was adequately excavated to our needs. Four measuring pipes were attached to the steel frame and extended from the trench bottom to the water surface of the river. We could observe the movement of these pipes to detect any uneven areas. The U-boot was pulled by a winch through the trench and could as stated before also determine the trench's width. Two of our people were stationed on a boat to check the measuring pipes. At our crossing at KP-100, we found some uneven areas at the trench bottom that needed correction, which was crucial as the siphon culvert had to fit into the trench absolutely precisely. We couldn't take any chances and had to ensure that the trench was cleaned correctly, which was done by one of our long arm excavators located on a pontoon. The trench spoil was placed downstream and used later as backfill material. This process took some time, but it was necessary to avoid any disasters so that the siphon culvert would not fit into the trench. For KP-100, the 205-ton siphon culvert made from our 42-inch X65 line pipes was constructed on site. The pipe wall thickness was 20.52 mm. It was 140 meters long, designed to have low buoyancy, and had a typical swan neck shape obtained by two 30-degree pipe hot bends at each end. The height of the culvert was around 12 meters. Two steel pipes with a coal tar epoxy coating were also attached outside the concrete coating of the siphon, measuring 4.5 inches in diameter and running the entire length of the culvert. One of the steel pipes was used to hold a 2-inch HDPE twin conduit for the fiber optic cable that was installed later. All circumferential welds on the siphon culvert were 100% X-rayed. The culvert successfully passed a pre-hydro test at 160 bars of test pressure, and the duration of the holding time with this pressure was 24 hours. This was almost the double pressure of the pipeline operations pressure. It has to be emphasized that during the installation process, the siphon culvert was not lifted completely from the ground to prevent the overloading of our lifting equipment and the uncontrolled dropping of the heavy steel concrete giant. On both ends of the culvert were the hot bends to which steel sleds were mounted. The pipe razors were protected with hardwood tied with steel and nylon straps, securely fastened to prevent any coating damage. A similar but lighter and shorter siphon culvert was produced for KP-68, which weighed 145 tons, measured 99 meters long, and was fabricated at Sayak River Kwai construction site. We were using a grouping of eight side booms, two 70-ton cranes, and an excavator on a pontoon. With our side booms, we were able to move the siphon culvert from the area where it was fabricated close to the West River Bank in a slow and steady manner. The 70-tone cranes were positioned on either side of the river, while the excavator was situated on a floating pontoon in the middle of the waterway. After the crane was connected our side booms began moving the siphon culvert gradually into the river, while the crane on the left side held the culvert upright. Later the excavator played a critical role in ensuring that the culvert was positioned over the center line of the trench. To move the culvert through the entire river trench, we connected a steel cable to the sled mounted in the hot bend area of the siphon to a side boom cat 594 with a winch located on the opposite side of the river. 
As the siphon culvert emerged onto the water's surface, buoyancy forces came into play and lifted it slightly. To keep the siphon culvert in the correct position against the river's current, we used steel cables connected to the excavator on the pontoon located in the middle of the river. Once the culvert passed the halfway mark, the second crane located on the east side of the river took over and moved the culvert forward to the excavated trench on the right of Ware River embankment. We repeated the same process at the launching bank by centering the siphon culvert into the trench. After aligning the culvert, we carefully lowered it into the trench and filled it with water. The weight of the water ensured that the culvert sat securely on the trench bottom. With this achievement that the siphon culvert was laying filled with water in our excavated trench on the river bottom, the most crucial part of the open-cut river work was completed. I would like to extend my gratitude to everyone involved in this project, with a special thanks to Heinz Orth for his tireless work on both crossings, which greatly contributed to the success of this River Kwai Crossing Challenge. We filled the trench with sandy material until it was 0.20 meters above the pipe. Following this, we stabilized it with excavated excess material for the remaining 0.80 meters. After partially backfilling the trench at the river banks, we connected the siphon culvert to the pipeline on both sides. The pipeline hydro test number 12 at the river crossing KP68 was carried out from KP69 plus 882 to KP38 plus 400 and was successfully completed on the 18th of June 1998. The pipeline hydro test number 14A at the river crossing KP100 was carried out from KP100 plus 351 to KP101 plus 144 and was successfully completed on the 28th of June 1998. Upon completion of our open-cut construction, restoration of the river pipeline crossings began immediately. Here again, the Kowlarm Dam, located in Tongpapam, regulated access to these crossings, this means at low water levels of the River Kwai, we had straightforward access. To prevent the degradation of river banks, we used excess rock which we had plenty. The entire process, from the start of construction until the land restoration was completed, took approximately six weeks. All areas surrounding the River Kwai crossings and farmland were restored to their original state. Our measures ensured that permanent erosion controls were re-established as they were prior to our construction. We graded all the topsoil equally on the farmland and restored all slopes and waterways within the project area to pre-construction contours, including revegetation. Our revegetation work was adequate and played a role sufficient in stabilizing the soil surface. Our work started on both crossings on the 20th of April and was completed on the 12th of July 1998. We spent 46,344 hours working on the River Kawi crossing at KP68 and 48,544 hours at KP100. The total cost, including engineering, management and overhead expenses, was around $2,600,000. It's worth noting that, given the total length of 542 meters, horizontal directional drilling would have been slightly less expensive and spared us a lot of hassle and frustration. Let me also tell you here that pipeliners do not like river crossings at all, because those crossings are always a pain in the neck. The pipeline started its operation to transport gas in September 1998. Now I will talk about our claims, PTT back charges, and change order settlements. On 13 September 1998, we submitted a time extension claim to PTT, which we believed we deserved. PTT granted a time extension of 101 days, which is equivalent to 3.32 months, on 23 September 1998. This was due to issues that arose on the project that were PTT's responsibility, and I have partially shown those issues in this video. Along with the time extension, compensation for the additional work period was requested, which was backed up by a detailed cost breakdown that was provided to PTT. On the 2nd June 1999, PTT's management held a meeting where they achieved a settlement of all the claims made by us, including all back charges. The agreed due amounts were paid to us on the 9th of July 1999. The settlement of all the open change orders took a long time, but was eventually resolved by the end of January 2000, with a contract amendment between PTT and us. It is important to note that despite PTT's animosity towards the Tasco Mansman joint venture, everything between PTT and us was resolved amicably. It was the best outcome for both parties. On 2 June 2000, PTT issued the final project acceptance certificate. Although payments from PTT were delayed, particularly for change orders, it is worth noting that payments were made despite the economic crisis in Thailand at the time. On 20 August 2000, we received the final payments from PTT. 
thanks to an increase in the total contract price, the joint venture was able to make a small profit. PTT returned all the Tasco Mansman performance securities in February of 2001. It may seem fortunate to some that the Adana Pipeline project was not cancelled during the economic crisis in 1997-1998, considering what happened to the Thai government SkyTrain project with company Hopewell. However, it should be noted that the Adana gas pipeline was a different type of project with international links, and it was crucial for the power station in Ratchaburi. Without the Adana gas, the power station would not have had a natural gas source to fire up. It is important to acknowledge that PTT was fortunate to have a good contractor like us, who completed the difficult pipeline job at a reasonable price, compared to other contractors who provided higher bids for the project. Although the four-year project relationship ended on 1 February 2001, it is unfortunate that there was never a true partnership between PTT and us during the project execution time. On 3 December 2001, the Tasco Mansman joint venture closed out all its external and internal affairs and was subsequently dissolved, marking the end of its existence after being established in October 1996. Despite being planned for a shorter period, the joint venture lasted for a little over five years. As someone who played a key role in the venture, I am proud to have been involved in both its opening and closing. I was particularly involved in the Giordana Pipeline project, having made the bid in September 1996 and stayed until its final conclusion. Mr. Somchit, the CEO of Tipco Asphalt, used to refer to it as your baby, which always brought a smile to my face. Please note that the pipeline has been in operation since September 1998 and is still one of the main gas transport pipelines in Thailand. The following pictures of the year 2009 show the embankments of the River Kwai KP100 crossing. With this, the story of when a 42-inch pipeline met the River Kwai in Kanchanaburi is finished. Thank you for watching and goodbye.